somatic experiencing was very much of a bottom-up process, traditional mm -hmm. talk therapy uh, top-down. Now, it's but in somatic experiencing, we access both the top-down, the sensations, and the top-down. And, um, and again, where am I getting this information from? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's when I doing a little research because Jung Carl Jung talks about the collective unconscious, mm -hmm. and that was clearly what I was accessing. Again, it yeah. could be mystical, but you know, I mean, Jung was a very, in a way, a very traditional psychiatrist, but he was also a mystic. And I, I again, I don't, I don't give apologies for that part of me. I, I give appreciation. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mujica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. Welcome, Dr. Peter Levine. I am so thrilled to be talking to you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, you're looking forward. <laughs> yeah, it, I just wanted to say it was really um, very special for me to read your book. I, I'm only halfway through right now because I just got it. And it was just remarkable um, the way the way you found somatic experiencing from your own traumatic events. Um, it's remarkable for me because I found somatic experiencing from my own sexual assault. And that's uh -huh. what actually mm -hmm. led me to somatic mm -hmm. experiencing. Um, I went to the dentist's office and he drilled into my tooth and my tooth broke. And this nerve pain went all the way down into my colon. And the sensation of that brought me back to all these blocked memories of a sexual assault. Know. Wow. And two years later, I wound up, wound up in the office of a somatic therapist and it completely changed my life. And then I yeah. trained and now I teach and I do it. And so I was so moved to hear your story and just how that reflected. Right. Well, in a way, it's the backstory. It's my personal story. I mean, it's called an autobiography of trauma, a healing journey. And uh, well, let me just kind of uh, preface things a little bit first. You know, uh, I, I'm at the age where I clearly, even though I may be vital, and healthy right now, but I have less time in the future to live than I have in the past. So I thought this was an important time for me to do my own excavation, to really look at the events, the experiences that have shaped my life. And and so I, I was doing that. And then a very dear friend of mine said, Peter, you really should make this as a book, publish it as a book. And I remember saying, there's no way I would do that. It's too personal. It's too raw. And uh, it was just for me. And she said, well, really think about it. And I I felt conflicted uh, or ambivalent at best. And then often in my life, in, in my work, in my writing, uh, an important dream comes that really gives me the solution that I'm struggling to find. So in this dream... I'm standing in front of a large field and I have in my hands a whole bunch of papers and there's some kind of a manuscript because I can see there's typewritten. Yeah. And so I look here to the left, I look to the right. And again, I don't know what to do, what's the right way forward. And so in that moment of conflict, this strong breeze came from behind me and took all of these papers and blew them into the wind, mm. into the meadow to land where they might. Mm. And then when I awoke, I realized that the decision had been made for me and that this is something that I felt and I, I've gotten feedback from other people who have read it uh, while, I, while I was writing it that this is something that could help a lot of people in their own healing and telling their own stories. So that's when I finally decided to publish it as a book. And now that the book is out, I have both still a little bit of fear. Oh my God. <laughs> but at the same time, I feel a relief that I've done it. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. I'm glad I did it. I know, hey, what could be better than helping people while you're asleep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's so right. that's sort of the backstory. 
And oh, we'll... well, I've, I just have to ask you about that piece because it fascinates me um, in the SE world of capacity and the nervous system and, and pendulation. Personally, what's it like in your body to know that it's out there? Like you said, relief and fear. What, what, what's that process been like to be with those? Well, the, the fear is a constriction here. The relief is an opening and a flow of sensation and energy in my body. Mm. That is the relief. And it's not completely, oh, gosh, you know, I don't I don't have to fret anymore. Mm. I mean, I don't really. But it, it, it's a big step forward in my life to write it as a book. And again, with the hope, well, no, with with the strong conviction that it could help people. Mm. And um, yeah. And I mean, I'm not saying it replaces therapy, but it could be a good avenue also. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. As a, it, it was different for me reading it from your other books that I've read. There was something about it that was so relational because it was about you. And yeah. it felt so personal. And something in that relational aspect touched me on a deeper level than even some of the books I'd read before. So I, I already feel it going into the roots of my body in a deeper way. Wow. Well, thank you. That's the kind of feedback that gives me the relief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Well, where, where did it take you in writing it? What, I guess, what became more clear for you about your relationship between your experiences and developing SE just from writing it? Oh, okay. Well, one of the important things in somatic in SE somatic experiencing is that we don't take people right to the core, to the center of their trauma, because that rarely is helpful and can be harmful. Mm -hmm. So we find a way to kind of come into the periphery and I'll also look at other experiences that involve full body sensations that are those of um, that are those that are supportive and positive and really allowed me to have a foundation to work with the very difficult memories, very difficult experiences. And um, I was experiencing uh, all different kinds of uh, si uh, disturbing symptoms, sensations, and also some brief flashes of images. And I realized that it was time that I took a dose of my own medicine. Mm. In other words, that I really put my hands in one of the people that I had trained to guide me to see where these sensations are coming from. And when was this, Peter? When was this happening? Um, uh, gosh, 30 years ago, okay, something like that. And, uh, yeah, I think it was about 30 years ago. So anyhow, what came up first is the way, again, the way we work from the periphery is an image, an image and a memory, really a clear memory of when I was about four or five years old. And it was my birthday. And in the night, my parents came into my bedroom and laid some tracks, like for model train tracks, underneath my bed, out into the room, and then back underneath the bed again in, a, in an oval. So to say I was excited would be an understatement. I opened my eyes and just heard that and saw that. And I literally jumped out of bed <laughs> and I controlled the speed of the train with the transformer. And I also, um, also made the horn go woot, woot, woot. <laughs> I, 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 in that moment, I knew again, not cognitively, but I knew that I was cared for, that I was loved. And that contradicted a lot of my later experience or even some of my earlier experience. So really embodying that memory was absolutely essential because again, it gave me that platform to go further. Mm -hmm. So then what came up next is, um, well, when I was in junior high school, middle school, there, there, there's a, a, a mobster named Johnny Diaguado, Johnny Dio. And he was absolutely ruthless. And because of coincidence, they tried to get my father to testify against him, to put him in prison or to send him back to, I guess, the thing. And uh, so, but we knew 
me and my brothers, we knew something was seriously wrong just by their body language. And, but it was never spoken about. Mm -hmm. And we never got the sense that, yes, this is difficult, but that we'll be taken care of. And so that was never said. So uh, anyhow, I would come get home. I would scarf down some Pepperidge uh, Farms cookies and some milk. And then I would go downstairs and run across the road to uh, Reservoir Oval Park and climb the wrought iron fence and then go down through the bushes. And there was a cinder running track below. And so I started running in this in this memory, in this image. And I started to feel power in my legs. Mm. And this was important, again, because we felt powerless with all of what was going on. I learned later that my father was told that if he testified against Johnny Dio, by the way, he's the one that's the most murderous one that's featured in the movie, The, Go the Good Fellows and The Irishman. So he was as mean as you can imagine i have a picture of him in the book and you just look at him and you go oh jesus mm -hmm. this guy he's a murderer and uh, this helped me kind of get back in my body and so i would run around and 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 breathe and and feel the movement of my legs again i'm doing this in the image in the sensation that with the per with the person who's guiding me and um, but then one day I climbed the fence and I climbed down and off to the left, I saw a group of people. They, they were definitely mobsters and they were smoking cigarettes and they had these motorcycle hats. I think they even had motorcycle jackets. And um, my in my body, I knew something was wrong. I could feel the hairs on my back standing up. I felt chills. And I thought, what should I do? Should I try to climb back up the fence? But then they could easily catch me. So I decided to run down as I had done before to the running track. So as I entered the bushes, I was grabbed from behind. And again, I could feel these as motoric responses, as body responses. I was pushed down to the ground. My head hit against the rock, so I was semi-conscious. And, and I was raped violently. And I realized later that this was to send a message to my parents, to my father, that if they testified, this is what would happen. But I never told my parents. In a way, I never told myself. Mm -hmm. I walled it off in a compartment in my brain, in my body. And there it was until these symptoms started coming up, you know, many, many years later. And I was able to work with that and come back to my body and come back to the sensations that I had with the train, waking up to the train. So, um, so anyhow, that's in a way, uh, it's, that's in a way I, I developed somatic experiencing to help myself, but obviously it helps of course, many others because it's now practiced taught in 44 different countries, you know, by I think 60 or 70, um, trainers, that I trained or that other trainers trained. And uh, I think they've trained about uh, 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 about 60, 60 plus thousand people. Mm -hmm. So the world, the, 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 the word was getting out. You know, when I started to develop some essay, uh, you know, I, I was taken to be a fringe person. Mm -hmm. This was not really something serious. And so I really, you know, the story of Johnny Appleseed who goes mm -hmm. across the country in the United States planting seeds, apple seeds, and that's where supposedly all of these orchards came from. Well, I was like Johnny Appleseed, but planting these ideas that I was discovering in SC. And it was qu quite a burden. And I could, I could literally feel it on my shoulders. But now, mm -hmm as I have all of these teachers, these trainers who are working out in the world, that 
has that that burden has been lifted from me. Mm -hmm. I feel like to the question, have I done enough? I can answer in the affirmative. Yes, I have, because the work is out. And many, many, I'm surprised how many people know about it. Um, I mean, even some of the interviewers that you wouldn't have thought had any experience, they talk about how informative uh, SC was for them in their lives. So that's that question. Now, there's another question that takes me, in a way, the rest of the book. And that is, am I enough? And I think that was the motivations in writing the book, writing the, the autobiography. I, my friend Gabo Mate wrote that one man's journey from searing pain to joy, from uh, self-hatred to self-love. And when I read that, I was deeply, deeply moved. As to other people who have written these blurbs, these endorsements, I feel really supported by them, touched by them. And uh, so maybe uh, you guide me again where you would like me to go. I was just feeling into it. There's so much when you, when you spoke about it, your whole story that you just laid out, the train, the this over kind of this the over spirit, this impending doom in the household you can quite place, this powerlessness, yeah. power in your legs running. Yeah. The very place where you found power was then a place where you were overpowered. Exactly. That's exactly. interesting to me. I, I think that's how I experience somatic experiencing as the person receiving it and the person that does it. It's it's quite psychedelic and it it touches into these seeming oppositions, but it kind of I don't know, everything seemed to lose duality in a way. Uh, and I, I get curious about that for you as someone that developed yeah, it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you talk about psychedelic. Actually, I, I do have two sections in the book mm -hmm. really are about psychedelics. And in, uh, in uh, self-disclosure, you know, I came to Berkeley in 1964. So that was a time of uh, drugs, uh, uh, <laughs> rock and roll drugs and Sex, right? And sex. <laughs> <laughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, everybody was using psychedelics uh, recreationally at the time. But uh, since that time, and especially since they're coming up now much more into the therapeutic um, armamentarium, uh, I, I, it's like I see clouds from both sides now, like mm -hmm. from Judy Collins' song. And... I, I'm much more measured. I think there are great promises, but there are also pitfalls that have to be seriously examined mm -hmm. in the use, the safe use of these of these substances. So I, as I say, I've written about that in the autobiography, and I've also talked to some of the people who are doing that work and 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 doing research on that work. Now, you also, okay, but along with psychedelic, it, has maybe a mystical bent. I think that was mm -hmm, sort of mm -hmm, absolutely maybe, yeah yeah. It's it's true. It, it does have a mystical. It has a shamanic bent. Mm -hmm. And when I started teaching the work, you know, I I went towards legitimacy. It's only really in writing the book that I've told some of the story I haven't been able or willing to talk about. And so. Uh, People have thought of me sometimes as a mystical person, as a um, as a shamanic person. And while I actually I admire both of those, and I've had the opportunity to meet with different shamans in different parts of the world, and they, they've been very influential in my thinking. Uh, but again, I wanted to make this uh, transmissible in in psychological thought and in, in scientific thought. Mm -hmm. So I've really spent the book balancing between the two. And uh, and again, now I, I, I don't feel reticence to talk about those influences because they are important. And again, because I know the work is out there, it mm -hmm. doesn't have anything in a way. I mean, it does have something to do with me, but it, it really is, you know, it's, it's not, again, off of my shoulders mm -hmm. and it's out in the world. Well, wait, oh, I need to pause there a minute because there's two things that are, that are really important that I want to hear more about. 
I want to hear more about this experience because your life experiences and from your body, this, this practice developed. And so this moment of the place of power in the park became a place of being overpowered. Now, how does that show up in SE and the development of it? How does that experience come through? Well, you know, again, um, you know, SC works to heal uh, different kinds of trauma, you know, from single event to what's sometimes called developmental trauma or chronic stress. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, um, we work with that in some way differently. Um, you know, one of the things about somatic experiencing, I think that was one of your questions, is that it's not a psychotherapy method per se. When I started teaching my first group, there's a group of 12 or 15 uh, therapists from Berkeley. They would come out to my house in Wildcat Canyon. They called it my tree house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would work with people and then try to explain, to get a language to explain what I was, what I was doing. And um, again, you know, when you, you have body sensations that contradict those of threat and overwhelming helplessness, mm -hmm. you take the, 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 the sting, the venom out of those memories, and then we can move forward because we're stuck in that time. Mm -hmm. So when I started developing somatic experiencing, uh, I had the following dream, another dream. Mm -hmm. And in this dream, talk about mystical, uh, I met with this, and there was a room, and I, I was entered the room, and there was a man dressed in a black robe with purple sashes coming over his shoulders down below his waist. And I recognized him as some kind of a spiritual teacher, a spiritual guide of some sort. And so he hands me this box, a wooden box, and it has straps over it, brass straps. And he hands it to me, and I take it in my hand. And he doesn't say anything. But I know somehow I pick up something non-verbally from him, and I know I'm supposed to go through this other door, and it goes to another room. And in the far side of that room, there's a a cast iron safe. So I open the safe and put the uh, put the the box there. When I awoke from the dream, it was one of those dreams like I had no idea what the dream was about. And those are usually the important dreams. And uh, and in working with the image of the box, because that was what stood out for me in the dream. And. I remembered my childhood uh, 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 book called Treasure Island, and it had pictures, and one of the pictures it has was of this treasure box. So, okay, so this was a treasure. So I'm bringing this treasure, and I'm putting it into a safe. Oh, safe, safekeeping. Mm -hmm. So again, the mystical shamanic part, mm -hmm. I had to push away to keep it safe mm -hmm. for modern scientific exploration and one of the one of the endorsements was from a, a, a german professor of neuroscience and he said the this book is a uniting of science and shamanism yes yes i, I, I find I, that so validating because yeah. for years i've said to people in the se community and people that study your work I, i've asked them you know i wonder if there's some trojan horsing going on where this like scientific psychology lens is allowing it to be digested in the world yet yeah. there's this strong undercurrent of mysticism and spirituality and shamanism yeah. that isn't being overtly discussed hey my friends i created a space that is affordable accessible and anyone is allowed to join anytime and it's called the library membership the Library Membership is an online, private platform that hosts dozens of my webinars, my somatic practices, private mini-lectures, and movement practices. There's also a monthly sound healing, and you'll be invited to a weekly Tuesday live mini-practice with me and other participants. You'll also be invited to be a live audience member in our monthly HLN Team podcast recordings. 
where you'll take place in the Q&A that happens off air after the episode is filmed. For more information on this membership, click on the link below or go to holisticlifenavigation.com and click on membership and then library. You can join right now and you can cancel or pause your subscription at any time. I look forward to seeing you in there. But I actually just found some of the questions I wanted to ask you. And that was part of it is how through your work and in your books, there's so much about apparitions and mm -hmm. dreams and like Albert yeah. Einstein, these conversations you have with him. Well, yeah. Where does that come from for you? Like who, who taught you to question. honor these? Interesting question. Okay, so this is now must have been the early 1970s. I was both developing SE and starting to teach it. But I was also uh, working on my doctoral dissertation, which is about ac accumulated stress. It's about the autonomic nervous system. So it's also an important foundation in developing the scientific aspect of SE. So anyhow, I would go, you know, once or twice a week to my favorite restaurant, the Beggar's Banquet on San Pablo Avenue. And the waitresses knew me there and, and greeted me by name. And they would sit me down at the usual table. And uh, usually I would start with a bowl of wonderful vegetable soup, uh, along with some French bread that was just perfect, crispy on the outside, <laughs> soft and moist on the inside. And I would just, you know, it's like the troubles from the day just kind of faded. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, uh, coming from the left, I saw this shadowy apparition talking about apparitions. And it was this old man with crazy wild hair and wearing a crumpled jacket that was like three sizes too big. And so first, of course, I was stunned. And uh, I realized this was an image of Albert Einstein, as you, as you mentioned. And as a scientist, I recognize this as active imagination, mm -hmm. which is not like hypnosis. It's not like mental imagery at all. It's something that really comes from the unconscious and unites mm -hmm. unconscious and consciousness in a special blend. So anyhow, he introduced himself and sat down and we carried on conversations for about a year. And I would ask him questions about what I was doing when I was developing my work and my thesis work. And he would ask me questions about my questions. It's kind of like the Socratic method of inquiry. And again, as I said, this went on for a good part of a year. And also, I was starting to become aware that many of the people that I worked with, the traumas that happened were not things that necessarily happened in their lifetime but in their parents grandparents and ancestors mm -hmm. in their lifetimes and i asked einstein about that and as like a dream within a dream he takes me to a pond small pond and he has a yardstick and all along the yardstick there are small stones and he takes this, the the yardstick and and twists it so all of the the stones fall together at the same time and so it goes rippling out in forward in sideways and back in other words it ripple like ripples in all directions mm -hmm. and of course this is something that Einstein knew a lot about because you know that was the space time ripples then I talked to him about what I was observing with some of my clients and he showed me that what happens if when these waves are propagating in all directions, if something gets stuck and it can't fully propagate, then everything in that wave front is uh, is distorted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I asked him again in this act of imagination, I asked him um, what he would advise me to do, how he advised me to work on that. And I remember distinctly him saying, Peter, I don't have that answer, but you do. Mm. So I spent some years really working with these effects, 
So I thank my active imagination of Albert Einstein. But what, so, what, 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 what inside of you allowed you to pursue your active imagination? Not say, oh, that's, that's stupid. Like, I, I don't understand. That's not, that's not common. I'm curious about that. Um, you know, what, when I researched a little bit, read about active imagination, it talks about what I was saying. But it says that this is a capacity that children have, but it's lost with adults. And I remember thinking, what a shame. Mm -hmm. What a shame. I think that's such an important vehicle for us to connect with our unconscious processes. So anyhow, I left it there. And then I went on with my life. And like 20 or 30 years ago, I was visiting my parents in New York and I was downtown going to museums and then coming back at the end of the day, taking the D train to 205th Street, walking up the road and then coming to my parents' apartment. And they were sitting in a couch, but above them, there was a bookshelf. And one of the books that stood out was Einstein's Theory of Relativity. So that just triggered me, prompted me to tell my parents, especially my mother, about my encounters, with, my imagined encounters with Einstein. And she stood up straight and she said, Peter, I know why that happened. And I thought, what? Mm -hmm. And she went on to say that when I was uh, eight, when she was eight months uh pregnant with me in utero, eight months. Uh, she and my father were canoeing on this lake in New Jersey. And all of a sudden, the strong wind squall came and tipped the canoe over. And they couldn't ride it, and they couldn't get back into the canoe. And they certainly would have perished, as would have I. But just then, a small sailboat came by, and there was a uh, an, an old man and a, and his young stepdaughter, it turns out, and they pulled my parents to safety. And they introduced themselves as Albert Einstein and as his stepdaughter. Ooh. And I said, holy mackerel. Yeah, I have chills. It's amazing. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, it was one of these things that was revelatory. I mean, it's really, you know, when you talked about mystical, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, in a way, if my mother would have been, you know, up at my age, mm -hmm. I, sh I think she would definitely have been considered it intuitive, but maybe even a psychic. Mm -hmm. She really had that that ability. I mean, I had some horrible experience with her, but this was something that I I am grateful to have that gift from her mm -hmm. and from learning from my from my father. So my mother re reasoned that because uh, I met Einstein in a moment of life threat in utero, that he somehow became a guide for me, a spirit guide. Mm. Wow. What a sophisticated, powerful um, perception she had about that. That's, yeah. was that. Was that shocking to you when she said that? Or did she oh, always speak like it? Yeah, it was more than shocking. Well, it was stunning. Stunning, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had to say, okay, I have to let in the possibility of an other reality Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, because again, I was more or less at peace thinking about this as active imagination. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was going a little bit there to the edge, but still. But then when my mother told me this, it, it's like my whole worldview changed. I, I mm -hmm. haven't heard that before, but yeah, my whole worldview changed. How so, Peter? What happened for you after that moment? Well, I think I was open to getting messages from the other side. Mm -hmm. One of the things I talk about in one of the chapters is um, where some of my information came from. Because I was, I don't like the word channeling, but I was somehow open to this other realm. Mm -hmm. I talk a little bit about the Akashic records, mm -hmm. the records of everything that has ever happened in the world, and how it plays through in the present. And so again, that was definitely a mystical thing, as was the Kabbalion. Uh, and 
somatic experiencing was very much of a bottom-up process, traditional mm -hmm. talk therapy uh, top-down. Now, it's but in somatic experiencing, we access both the top-down, the sensations, and the top-down. And um, and again, where am I getting this information from? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's when I doing a little research because Jung. Carl Jung talks about the collective unconscious, mm -hmm. and that was clearly what I was accessing. Again, it yeah. could be mystical, but you know, I mean, Jung was a very, in a way, a very traditional psychiatrist, but he was also a mystic. And I, I again, I don't, I don't give apologies for that part of me. Mm -hmm. I, I give appreciation mm -hmm. for that for that part of me. Well, but, I, I find it. I guess what really moves me here, as you're saying this, like I feel this real tenderness in my heart it might be mm -hmm. gratitude uh because again doing so much somatic experiencing in my life every moment feels like a mystic moment with someone's mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. and with my own the way these things come through and, and this question does come up the way you said you know where am i getting this information from it's such a powerful question and it's yeah. as if se ushered itself into this world through your body through these mystic experiences that's right that's right yeah, there's another thing that I, um, well, yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I talk about that and I am grateful, you know, even though I experienced tremendous amounts of trauma, I'm really mm -hmm. deeply appreciative for who I, my life, for who I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Gabor said, going from self-hate to self-love. And it's been a long journey and it's not a journey that's over. Mm -hmm. It's a journey that I'm with in some way every day. Yeah. And especially in my relationships. Yeah. I have a question about that. Um, with relationships, with even client relationships, when you see somebody suffering or you see somebody in pain, mm -hmm. because you're aware that this trauma in a way initiated you into this experience you, you share with all of us now, how do you even view trauma? Because some people see it as a really horrible thing only. Some people see it as a gift. Like, how do you view it in a mystical sense through SE? Well, it's both. Experiences? You okay. know, one of, one of the books that I'm now working on, I, 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 graphic, <laughs> I have graphophilia. Uh, and this is, I'm doing it with actually a, a colleague of mine, a friend, a colleague of mine in, in Copenhagen, Denmark. And it's called uh, Spirituality and Trauma, Resilience hmm. and the Human Spirit. Nice. And yet trauma can cripple us, but also when we work effectively with it to transform it, to go from awful to awe, mm -hmm. there is this balance between some of these states that happen in the in working through trauma and different so-called mystical or spiritual openings. And so again, this is an area that I I wouldn't say I avoided, but I thought it best not really explore. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, in my later years, now I feel free to mm -hmm. to to do these explorations, but also to share them. To and it's not the right word, but to normalize them. Yeah, the yeah. It's parts right. of the human experience. And the more we're open to them, the more we can be transformed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it, I think what interests me about that as well, just like you said, share and normalize it. You've shared in such a generous way before this book, the actual practices of SE and trauma healing itself. You've been super generous with that. And now you're being generous with your own experiences, kind of the real training you went through to bring you to how you brought these things yeah. in. Yeah. So what I'm curious about is as someone who's private and really likes being private and doesn't want to be in the public eye and this dream and your friend kind of propelled you to release this book what has it been like you know for your body to be seen specifically to be seen even with me as you speak about these things right but remember to be seen is uh linked to being murdered if they correct. saw me or being raped correct so uh so in a way i had to withdraw you know pe sometimes people see me as an extrovert extrovert and i do have some extroverted qualities but i think i'm more, pr more primarily an, an introvert and a private person mm -hmm. and i think people don't realize that i'm a very shy person mm -hmm. in many ways 
a very tender person and um and to again put something like this out in the world for a private person is in itself quite a challenge yeah and and i appreciate that part of me that that's reflective and i think without that also i don't i doubt if i would have developed the work or certainly not in the way i did develop it because a lot of this had to do with introspection of really going inside and being inside mm -hmm. and i think that's a gift that um well the different people in my life have given me you know one of the chapters in the book are is the four most important women in my life mm -hmm. and then the four most important men in my life the four most imp important women are more women who were about embodiment and the four men were much more intellectual mentors and um the th four women i'll briefly mention it I have to make sure that I get off mm -hmm. at noon, uh, is a woman named Charlotte Selvers. And at the age of 96, she ran off with her 50-year-old, eloped with her 50-year-old gardener and continued to teach until she was 104 oh. when she passed. Yeah, Charlotte Selver. And I attended, there was a workshop she was giving with her husband, Charles Brooks, uh for the uh for the monks that were in the 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 uh green gulch meditation center and the tasahara meditation center so my friend jack uh he arranged it so because he was in that community he arranged it so that i could come to the workshop and it was the stupidest workshop i can imagine we were supposed to hold these stones and feel it in their hand feel the weight feel the texture feel the temperature feel the shape okay but then you're <laughs> supposed to be walking around the room and feeling how, and this is for an entire day feeling how our feet contact the ground how our arms move and i'm starting maybe getting a little bit but it's still it's just slipping away i remember meeting eye contact with one of the monks and i asked him how is this with you and he said big headache <laughs> i could concur concur yeah. at the end she had us laying down and doing different things and following our breath so imagining our breath coming in from our feet into our belly into our lungs and then back down coming out from our groin and think things that just didn't make any sense because mm -hmm. and remember i'm a scientist at mm -hmm. this graduate student and i know you don't breathe through your feet <laughs> right right you might have smelly feet but you don't breathe through <laughs> i'm breathing through those feet yeah so at the end of the workshop this is on this incredible uh gigantic church at the at uh, the top of o'farrell street in san mm -hmm. francisco so we went out the front door and I looked down in the valley and then to the Bay Bridge, the lights were on and it's like a mystical experience. This was the most beautiful experience I had ever mm -hmm. had. So I realized something went on there mm -hmm. and I was going to pursue that and follow it because at that time, you know, I, I didn't even really know I had a body. I certainly oh, wasn't. That's amazing. Contact. Yeah. with body so i was gifted with these teachers in different yeah. times of my life and i really wanted to honor them in my book and and the other one the other three was magda praskow who was a jungian oriented but worked a physiotherapist working with mm -hmm. breath also and then with uh ida rolf uh, who who developed what's now called rolfing structural integration and um and then a woman named Mira Rothenberg. And I really learned from her to trust my guts and my mm -hmm. heart. Work worked mm -hmm. with the very seriously disturbed children, uh, autistic and psychotic children. And she brought some of them through with her outstretched hand back from the citadel that they, they erected to protect themselves from a world that felt threatening. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, people, and I tried to talk about how each one has influenced me in my work, mm -hmm. both scientific and, in a way, sort of not exactly mystical, but 
but the 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 body the mystic the mystery of the body of mm -hmm. being in a living sensing knowing body and that's really my story well and until you had that session with one of the students that you were you know teaching mm -hmm. who was apprenticing with you or mentoring with you the session that brought you back to the assault until that moment you didn't even consciously experience in your body anything you had been through or little pieces no. up to, so there was nothing there until that no. moment it's just the symptoms because i was mm -hmm. you know teaching the work working with people mm -hmm. and that's when i started to developing those symptoms yeah and that's when i realized you know like chiron the wounded healer it mm -hmm. was time for my own healing i realized there was mm -hmm. something that i had pushed away and I mean, I, of course, I remembered about, you know, my family and my father eventually going to prison. Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew that, but I didn't really know anything consciously mm -hmm. about the assault and, and the rape. And that was necessary to excavate that very slowly, mm -hmm. gently shifting back and forth between those memories and some of the earlier memories that were positive or life affirming, life supporting. Yeah. I want, to read, I want to read this paragraph from your book in that piece. So you said, in doing a few follow-up sessions after this first one, yeah. I was able to wrestle with the shame demon and overcome my guilt and pervasive sense of badness. Yes. With tender feelings of genuine self-compassion and acceptance, I was able to place this memory in the distant past where it truly belonged. Yeah. The spell was broken. I was free. I was alive. I felt whole. That piece about placing it in the distant past where it yeah. belongs. Can you just explain that to us? Well, I think in a way you just did. <laughs> These are things, sometimes horrific things that have happened to us, but they've happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's where they belong. Mm -hmm. We need to sometimes look at them, excavate them, see the effect they have had on us. And it's not like, oh, just don't think about it or, you know, it's not that at all. Mm -hmm. It's a, a sense of self-acceptance, of self-care. And then looking at that and saying, okay, oh, it was horrible. That should never happen. And it did happen to this 13, 14 year old child. Mm -hmm. And I felt such care for her and such for him and such love for him. You know, the very last chapter in the book is called Living My Dying Through the Eye of the Needle. And it's about coming to my own mortality and uh, using a couple of psychedelics uh, in that journey. And what I did is I connected or reconnected with that 18 month old, two year old child that was before these violence and will always be there eternally in my life. But just tell me if you can see that. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's my, that tender part. And I think my journey, you know, comings and goings have, have come back to him mm -hmm. and being with him as this part that lives within me, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. inner reference this inner child i have one final question for you before we hop off uh while letting this book be seen and doing these interviews and knowing people are getting a deeper look at your your body and your life yeah. what se practice or what personal practice are you doing to keep yourself in a state of i don't know ground center openness as you're experiencing this i do that all the time i mean maybe not every single day but most days and I'll do some movement. I may do some kicking again to bring my legs more into my awareness. Mm -hmm. I, I just can do that in the bed, just laying down and doing that or different kinds of movements. I have a bellicon. It's a kind of trampoline, but it's not with springs. It's with these bungee cords. And it really lets you sense into your body and in, in a very gentle way. So I'll often spend 10, 15, 20 minutes there and then i'll just follow my sensations and see where they go mm -hmm. and usually that will influence my dreams and then my dreams will influence again in turn my sensations and my feelings so it is a daily mm -hmm. practice it, it, it really is you know i've never at least at this point been with some kind of a guru although in the dreams obviously mm -hmm. you know 
that would manifest. Uh, and I wonder about that. You know, there's a saying, when the student is ready, a teacher will appear. When the student is really ready, then the teacher will leave. <laughs> and I sort of feel that way. I haven't thought about it quite that way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to thank you for your time, Peter, and this mm -hmm. beautiful book and everything you contributed to us. Gladly. Um, can I mention the website where they can go for more information? Yeah, and we're going to put all that in the episode details, but please. Oh, okay. So, anyhow, it's somaticexperiencing.com, the website, somatic experiencing, one word. And then that, that links to you know my talks, my lectures, um, my books, and also to the organization, the uh, Somatic Experiencing International. That's responsible for for bringing this work into the world. It was a nonprofit that I founded some years ago, and now they're independent of me. And that link is there as well, which says where there are therapists in your area or trainings in in your area. So um, I enjoyed our talk, Luis. Yeah, thank and, you, Peter. Uh, me too. Yeah, yeah. And then I I have some things to do, and <laughs> I think I have another interview. So, <laughs> well, take care of yourself. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Ciao. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.